Our production designers, Ben Proctor and Sean Haworth, they've done something truly remarkable. Um, so we're on our interior Aero set, which is, uh, is, is theoretically on the planetoid Eros, which was a, was a formic colony uh, before we came in and bombed the hell out of them and got them, got them off. We chased them off, they went back to their home planet, um, and we've taken it over and turned it into a military base, mounting our own offensive against their home planet. It both reads as command school to the kids who don't really know that they're really fighting the war, and then it also is really a forward staging area, a real military command center. The environment of the battle room is obviously key to the whole movie. One of the things that I really like about Ben's designs is that they're not too sci-fi-y, futuristic-y. They're very grounded in, 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 in a sort of military idea. It's, it's almost like we're in a, a submarine or an aircraft carrier. They designed and redesigned and reworked things until we really could make something beautiful within the budget that we had. It was about figuring out other modular systems that would plug architecture quickly and dirtily into, into formic tunnels. Um, and, you know, the, Gavin said essentially, you know, imagine that the Army Corps of Engineers, or in this case, the IF Corps of Engineers, went through and, and had to build something really quickly. Here you see this clean hexagon where our, our robotic uh, milling machines have come through and kind of chiseled out a space to run a, one of our catwalks. It's not there now, but it will be. It's not architecture in the conventional sense. It's, it's quick installed um, modular catwalks and all that kind of thing. And from there on, we just styled those elements until they had the, the right feel. They give amazing dimensionality to sets, an amazing texture. You can, you can feel those sets. You know, we looked at reference from, you know, NORAD from Cheyenne Mountain, how they went about, you know, retrofitting, you know, and hollowing out mountains and partitioning spaces, essentially, you know, building a community on the ground uh, it would uh, retrofit a mountain or underground world to make it fit for humans. We, we came to the conclusion at some point, or the realization, I should say, that if we were going in and, and in this in this functional oriented way, using formic spaces as, as we found them um, to suit our purposes, why not have our, our, our uh, simulation room be installed in some formic cave that just happened to be big enough? Um, and in the case of how we, where we ended up, very much big enough, like vastly larger than what we needed. Creating the formics, as I'm sure anyone can imagine, takes a lot of development. We knew that the, the look of the formics was so fundamental to our movie, um, and Gavin felt strongly with us that this was the case, that we needed to hire a dedicated creature designer for the, for the production. When you sit down and you say, OK, who are the formics? What are they? They're insect-like is information we have. Um, well, how do insects interact? Um, what worlds do they live in? What are their structures? How do they construct things? And the one thing I really wanted to do was differentiate their world from our world. A critical thing for Gavin was that the formic architecture be something that's beautiful, something that, that uh, gives us a chance to, to get to know them um, as, as a, you know, not just a space-faring race of seemingly mindless warrior bugs, um, but something else. You know, clearly there's something big, grander about them, something elegant about, even about the way they design things. So that was important, you know, for a variety of reasons. One, that just to generate an interesting look to all of their spacecraft and cities and planets and all that, um, but also to give uh, Ender and the audience a chance to sympathize with them and so that when they get eradicated that you actually care. We looked at this race of insectoids and their colonies and how they built. Gavin actually pulled his own reference for termite mounds and encouraged us to watch with him, sometimes all morning, uh, videos online of, uh, you know, going over some of the latest discoveries in terms of how big ant colonies are underground, these excavation videos that are fascinating. These little things that we consider to be little mindless automata, you know, walking across the street are in fact, you know, part of this, this system that's actually really sophisticated and clearly the Formic society would be strongly influenced by that. When Ender finally comes face to face with the Queen, we had to see that this enemy that we've been looking at from a distance for the entire movie suddenly has oddly 
human-like traits, emotional traits that, you, that are conveyed through the design of this creature. Most of the descriptions of them are just by their name, Formix, you know, some kind of insect ant-like creature. At first, the concepts were quite scary. It looked pretty monstrous. Um, and I think after reviewing with, with uh, Gavin, we settled on a slightly prettier design. This was an uh, early take of the drone. This was their communication antenna here. Gavin thought this was a little too tribal, and so these morphed into some simpler appendages. Visually, we had quite a lot of latitude. My job was to come up with something that's interesting, new, and still identifiable as what we'd read as an insect. We looked at a lot of reference on the um, photo reference of both insects and sort of like crustaceans. Gavin had a lot of input on the surface quality. He really liked the way praying mantises look. The praying mantis has such grace and beauty, and yet it's a killer. These movements are universal. We dominate by trying to be bigger than the other person, and then the way we apologize and kind of try to be smaller. Um, so I think by, by introducing those very universal animalistic and human movements into this fictional character, she really communicates those feelings. I often think of internal structure to figure out anatomy for my creatures. I've never gone quite this in-depth before. It has multiple stomachs to feed itself, but the idea of their technology was that it would ingest the earth and rock that they're burrowing through to make their hive. It would take it into this uh, resin synthesis gland uh, where it's mixed with its own sort of catalytic polymers and sprayed back out with these airbrush-like appendages in its mouth and manipulated before it kicks off. And that's how the formists create their architecture and their spaceships. There was a lot of detail to the, uh, the surface and under the surface. There's a kind of iridescent shell and light penetrates quite deep inside and, and refracts around and it kind of has a, has a nice um, translucent feel. That was influenced a lot by the uh, praying mantis reference that we had. They had to be certainly intimidating at first, but by the end of the story, for us to understand why Ender has compassion for them, we have to see them through Ender's eyes. When you look your enemy in the eye, you realize that they're actually not that different from you. You have to empathize with it immediately because that's exactly what Ender's been going through the whole movie and that's what he's been holding on to. And finding her at the end is his confirmation that he was right in a way. He starts realizing that this was a beautiful race that he destroyed, not something that was ugly or overly dangerous. As Ender's walking through their architecture, he's walking past all these young formics sort of patterned a little bit off of Sicilian mummies, but also wanted them to evoke some pathos. I'm very, very proud of the work that those guys did on the queen at the end of the film. They gave this creature such dignity and such nuance while it may be intimidating and may be scary, is also beautiful. Ben and Sean did a terrific job.